Recording in progress. Hello, good morning. So good morning, everyone. Uh, okay. We will wait for other participants to uh, go to that in before we start our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>
So good morning, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. So, let us start. Uh, did you hear me? Does everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. But it's not very. But it's not too good in Indonesia. Okay. Uh, try again. Hello. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Yes, good morning. Uh, okay. My coach is clear. Okay. So let us now start. Uh, to our university officials, paper presenters, uh, faculty, researchers, and students present in this uh, session. Good morning, everyone. This morning. conference, Isaiah, is CDHA's contribution in addressing. Hello. I'm sorry for inconvenience. Uh, uh, Internet connection is not good here. So again, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, to our university officials, paper presenters, faculty researchers, and students uh, present, present in this session, good morning. Uh, this conference, Isaiah, is CBSA contributions in addressing the societal challenge of improving lives and uh, securing a sustainable future through research and innovation. It is an event organized by CVSUA in partnership with Vietnam National University of Agriculture and the Ecosystem Research and Development Bureau of Development of Environmental and Natural Resources. It gathers scientists and researchers as a global community of scholars in an open discourse of current issues and concerns. And the solutions in food systems, learning systems, and ecosystems. On that note, I welcome you all to session 3C Agriculture. We are indeed honored with your presence today. As we listen to our paper presenters, bracket uh, latest cutting edge resources and offer us comprehensive global discussions that address current issues in agriculture. So a total of 15 papers will be presented in this session. After uh, every five percent uh, presentations, a 10 minute open forum will be uh, accommodated or will be accommodated for some questions and queries from the audience. So we also have our live streaming via Facebook. And those who are uh, willing to ask questions, you, you may also use the chat box and write your questions. So without further ado, let us start the session with our first presenter from West uh, Visaya State University College of Agriculture and Forestry from Lumbunao, Iloilo, Philippines, with her uh, research title, Congruence, Congruence of DNA barcodes and leaf geometric 
met uh, morphometric in discriminating the five Philippine Pagasin species. So let us now welcome Miss Eva Joy G. Anestoso. Good day, everyone. I am Eva Joey from Masisaya State University College of Agriculture and Forestry, and I am to present my study on Fagaceae. So what are these Fagaceae? Fagaceae represents more than 900 species in angiosperms. It is one of the economically important family within the order of Fagales, and it is among the largest with nine genera. Good day, everyone. I am Eva Joey from Masisaya State University College of Agriculture and Forestry, and I am to present my study on Fagaceae. So what are these Fagaceae? Fagaceae represents more than 900 species in angiosperms. It is one of the economically important family within the order Fagales, and it is among the largest with nine genera. It's mainly distributed here in the Temperate and seasonally dry regions in the Northern Hemisphere with a center of biodiversity here in Southeast Asia. It is mainly of conservation concern because it is um, listed. 84 of these species are listed in the IUCN 2019 Red List of Threatened Species. And in the Philippines, in DNR Administrative Order 11 Series of 2017, 15 of these are endemic, 4 are classified as other threatened species, and 2 species are classified as vulnerable. It is mainly of economic importance because it is a major source of the world's hardwood timber. It is a source of biomass, fiber, wood products, and food, and it is one of the keystone species in forest ecosystem. So why do we need to study Fagaceae species? Fagaceae species are mainly of conservation concern, and the large number of species presents a major difficulty, especially to researchers who have a poor background of this family's anatomy and morphology. And this family appears insufficiently reported in literature here in the Philippines. So what needs to be studied with Fagaceae species? Um, there is currently an ongoing search for DNA barcodes of um, all species and, and the high rate of, Fagas of endemism here in Fagaceae species in the Philippines presents a major problem. And, um, DNA barcodes can be useful in the identification of plants because it is highly reliable, repeatable, and accurate. And it does not require a taxonomic expert expertise. But um, despite the advantages that recent molecular methods bring, first-hand observation of plant morphology is still as an essential component in the identification of the plant. And leaf morphology, the vegetative leaf morphology presents an important set of characters for taxonomic, ecological, and developmental studies. However, there are novel methods um, used to quantify um, leaf characters. This includes um, geometric morphometrics, mainly heart based and the outline based geometric morphometrics. There are correlations of molecular data and morphometric data. However, these studies mainly center on insects. So this is an initial in investigation on DNA barcodes and geometric morphometrics of Fagaceae species. So this study is about the congruence of DNA barcodes and leaf geometric morphometrics in discriminating the five Philippine Fagaceae species. The main objectives of this study was to establish the DNA barcodes for the species, identify the respective landmark and outline profile, as well as to correlate data among landmark shape coordinates and genetic data. Um, for the methods, um, prior to the conduct of the study, authorization was granted to the researcher. So this is the map information of the study site. This is the Mount Kalatungan Range Natural Park um, located in Bukidnon. And for the DNA barcoding, um, genomic DNA isolation was carried out using plant extraction kits and amplified for the RBCL gene. And after that, sequen sequence editing and analysis was followed through. And for the geometric morphometrics, 
two methods were used, um, the landmark-based and the alpine-based geometric morphometrics. The abaxial surface of the leaves were scanned using the Epson scanner and 30 leaf images for each species was utilized. Um, these are the software programs used for the geometric morphometrics. And for multivariate analysis of leaf shape or variability, principal components analysis, canonical variates analysis, and discriminant analysis was used. Also, similar to distances and UPGMA phonetic pentagrams was generated with the integration of molecular and morphometric data sets for relation coefficients and the significance was tested using the mantle test. So these are the five identified Pagasay species in Mount Kalatuan Range Natural Park. The Lithocarpus codotifolius, Lithocarpus lutei, Lithocarpus woodii, the Castanopsis evansii, and the Castanopsis philippensis. So these are the taxonomically identified Pagasia species, and these are the corresponding blast identification and the percentage identity. As you can see here, um, there is no 100% identity match between the taxonomically identified species to the blast identification species. And this Philippine endemic species, the Castanopsis philippensis, the Corpus lutei, Corpus lutei, all had a um, identification and a blast ID um, as Castanopsis conchina and Lithocarpus sensei. These are Chinese endemic native species. So we may imply here that stability at the genetic level is greater than at the morphological level. In plants, morphological variations in many leaf characters could be attributed to the phenotypic plasticity which may operate at the level of gene expression. Moreover, this may also imply that, this, that these specimens show greater similarity at least in a portion of the partial sequence of the chloroplast RBCL gene. BCL gene has a high level of similarity between species and a low level of mutation compared with other barcodes. And molecular identification through DNA barcoding is still in development, and the success of these methods is ultimately dependent on the coverage of the reference database. So this is the summary of the results of landmark-based geometric morphometrics. Number A represents principal components analysis, which is further confirmed by the canonical variance analysis. And the, can, the result canonical variance analysis is further confirmed by the discriminant. So according to the results, the reclassifications of species is from 90% to 100%. This is higher than the cutoff value of 75%, which implies that the landmark data sets um, signifies um, a difference in the leaf groups from the um, landmark data. And for the outline based geometric morphometrics, this is the summary of the results, the PCA, CBA, and DA. And the reclassification of species is lower compared to the landmark based analysis. It's only from 80% to 98.33%. However, it is higher than the cutoff value of 75%. And this may imply also that the shape or the outline of the leaves um, differentiated the leaf groups. Now for the integration of molecular and morphometric data, um, this is the result of the mental test summary statistics. So these are the data sets and R representation and P signified the significance at 0 0.05 level of significance. So as you can see here, um, the R correlation coefficient, um, the highest is the landmark versus DNA barcode. This only data with a significant um, correlation. So these are the generated genograms. A represents the genetic data set, and the landmark, and C represents the outline. As you can see here, the carpus is clustered into one, as well as the nopus is, is in another clade. This is also shown in the landmark data set. As you can see here, the carpus is grouped differently to Castanopsis group. However, as you can see here in the outline, the carpus UDI is classified here in Castanopsis group. And in comparing the landmark and the genetic data set, as you can see here, there is a difference between um, the order of the carpus UDI and the carpus calvary in comparing 
the study line mark data set. So we may imply that um, if the genetic is the basis we played here, um, there is a strength of landmark analysis over outline analysis. Because in outline, we only consider the bounding edge of the structure to be the homologous character. Whereas in landmark, we selected homologous ones, which are the same for all species. So Adams et al. stated that the data in outline do not clearly establish homology. And for the conclusion, Using the partial sequence of the chloroplast RBCL gene, identity was established in the BLAST algorithm, although there was no 100% identity match in the database. And RBCL gene marker was useful in discriminating the five species in the resulting endogram. Now, for the morphometric analysis, the profile of leaf shaped geometry further supports the discrimination of the five species. And for the integration of molecular and morphometric data, a strong significant positive correlation between genetic data and landmark data was supported by the mantle test. However, values are also positively correlated between landmark and outline, as well as between outline and DNA barcode. However, these values were not significant. And for the recommendations of the study, there should be a study regarding the difference in the dendrogram of the lithocarpus clade. So these should be um, confirmatory studies and standardization of landmark points in Pagasay species, as well as correlation of landmark based and outline based geometric morphometrics to other molecular markers. And interspecific variations should also be studied. So thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. So thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Toso, for, your, for sharing with us your uh, research paper. So let me remind you that uh, after every five presentations, a 10-minute open uh, forum will be followed up on the exam uh, questions and queries from the audience. So let me uh, proceed to the next presenter from Bulacan Agricultural State College and Edifonso Bulacan, Philippines, with his uh, research title, Prevalence and Identification of Gastrointestinal Parasites in Meat-Type Rabbit to Pecalysis Procedures. Uh, let us now welcome Dr. Celso Santo Domingo. Yes. Uh, Hello, good day. My name is Dr. Chels. Hello, good day. My name is Dr. Chels S. Santo Domingo a faculty staff in College of Agriculture at Bulacan Agriculture State College. Um, I make this video to present our research study entitled Identification of Gastrointestinal Parasites in Midnight Rabbits at Basi Rabbit Project through Fecalysis Procedure. To my introduction, because of the ASF scare in swine industry, we are looking for any alternative source of proteins to sustain food availability. One of these are the meat-type rabbits, which are relatively new compared to other livestock raised for meat in the Philippines. In this regard, occurrence of parasites is not yet well documented among rabbit farms in the country. So parasites can cause high economic loss because of the low live weight and also mortality. In order to detect the presence of parasites, the procedure for live animals is fecal sample analysis or simply called fecalysis. Fecalysis is a simple procedure that detect or identify parasites, eggs, and oocysts through fecal samples. And this study determined the presence of internal parasites through fecalysis among rabbits from the Basi project. Objectives of the study. The general objectives of the study is to determine the appearance of internal parasites in the rabbit project. This is the first research study about internal parasites in the Basi rabbit project. And this information that will be gathered will be 
serve as a baseline data for the following research. The specific objectives of the study is number one, detect the presence of infection involving gastrointestinal parasites in rabbits through flotation and sedimentation techniques of ecosystems. So it is important to categorize the gastrointestinal parasites into number one, worms or helmets, and specifically nematodes or roundworms, cestodes or the tapeworms, and trematodes or the fruits. And it can be protozoa like toxigosis. Next, identify the internal parasites detected through microscopic examination of the eggs detected in the sample. So it is important again to identify a specific species of the internal parasites to know the etiology, pathogenesis, and to formulate program for prevention and control and effective treatments. The number three, produce IEC materials or information, education, and communication materials on rabbit parasitism prevention based on the findings. So it is important to inform students and the rabbit farmers about the parasitism prevention and control. To the methodology, we use two types of methods. Number one is the flotation method in which separating the eggs from fecal debris by floating them on a variety of solutions. So we use sugar solution. And when feces are emulsified in liquids of high specific gravity and either centrifuge are allowed to stand, the worm eggs and many protozoan seeds float to the top while the heavy burst debris settles to the bottom. Um, number two method is the sedimentation method in which heavy parasites eggs sink to the bottom of the solutions. During the project, we collect fresh samples from different age groups starting at two months old. Then we process it in the laboratory. We did mashing and mixing apical samples with solution or the sugar solution. We also did filtering and removal of supernatant for sedimentation. Then each sample are tested in two methods we use and careful checking of samples under LPO and HPO. Then identification of parasites using rabbit medicine textbooks and other reliable reference. So the results and discussion. In this study, three types of parasites were observed from the animals. First is the intestinal coccidia, which is more than a dozen of intestinal coccidia species. And one of these is the Imeria exigua, which is less pathogenic. And the most pathogenic intestinal coccidia are the Imeria magna and Imeria erysigua. Second one is the hepatic coccidia or the Imeria stidae. Hepatic coccidia can cause severe disease in rabbits and the eggs is elongated, ovoid or ellipsoidal and has a smooth and colorless mouth. The third one is the tapeworm or the TNSPC. So in rabbits, act as an intermediate host. So the definitive host are the dogs and cat. And no practical treatment for the tapeworm in rabbits. And preventive measures should be done to avoid disinfection by avoiding the contaminated area or grass and by washing and drying of grass before feeding to the rabbit. In more details, in the results for intestinal toxicia, the present study shows that 100% of the studied animals, regardless of age, were positive to intestinal toxicia or the immune species. Less pathogenic intestinal toxicia species identified are the immune intestinalis, Emeria exigua and Emeria piriformis. So, although positive with intestinal toxigosis via phagalysis, all rabbits in this study look healthy and vigorous. It because intestinal toxigosis are seldom pathogenic. The possible infection um, came or acquired from the source feeders, possibly, and water source or forages for the hepatic toxigia or the Emeria stidae. The table shows the prevalence of hepatic oxygen where in only 15% of the 53 total animal sample for phagalysis had positive results. And these were those rabbits aging two months and below for a prevalence of 66.67% in this age group. The 15% prevalence of the oxygen may be connected with the stress related with winning time. And 
again, the possible infection sources are the breeders, water source, forages, and non-typarasitic medication needed. For the pink worm or the tiny species, the table shows the prevalence of intestinal worms or helminths, specifically cestos or tick worms belonging to tiny species, wherein only 7.55% of the pitted pre total rabbit sample for fecalsis had positive results. And these were also those rabbits aging two months and below for a prevalence of 33.5% each group. So rabbits are the intermediate host of the tiny species and possible source from Definitive host, dogs or cats, that contaminated the water or the forages. Now, preventive measures can be done by avoiding the contaminated feed source and washing and drying of grasses before feeding to the rabbits. So next, for the implication of the study in the Philippine rabbit industry, intestinal coccygiosis may be prevalent in rabbit farm since majority are bacteria producers and do not also give regular deworming and anti coccygian medication. Even if considered mainly as non-pathogenic, the prevalence of the infestation necessitates the formulation of a strategic prevention and control program against intestinal coccygiosis, which foremost includes proper floor design of cages and sanitation. Then, also, farmers have to be informed about thorough washing of fresh grasses and air drying before giving them to the rabbits and making sure to get forages from clay and virus only, meaning no contamination of the fecal feces or feces of insect control, such as preventing flies in the rabbit housing. This also helps since parasitic eggs can also be transmitted mechanically by flies from the source to the feeds or rabbit pellets or forages. In our conclusion and recommendations, in conclusion, the study determined the presence and identity of intestinal and hepatic oxygen and tapeworms in rabbits found inside Basti through flotation and sedimentation procedures. Results revealed that intestinal coccidia occurred in rabbits of all ages, but mixed infection of intestinal coccidia, coccidia with tapeworm occurred in young rabbits only. Other rabbits did not show clinical signs related to the parasites discovered owing to the low amount of parasitic load and to the low pathogenicity of the parasites. Recommendations of the study for rabbit farmers as contained in the IEC materials include cleanliness and sanitation in the farm, proper design of cage flooring, starts of clean water and feeds, insect control, and guide administration of anti-parasitic agents. Other study on rabbit pests and disease are needed to help rabbit production in the country and to mitigate unwanted disease outbreaks in the future. So that's all. Thank you. Um, also, I am thankful to the organizer for this event, or ICEA, for the opportunity to share our research study and hopefully help rabbit farmers and students. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Salso uh, Santo Domingo, for sharing with us your uh, research paper. So, to proceed with, uh, our next presenter is. Uh, Professor Marjale Periol from Rumdon State University of Roblon, Philippines, with her uh, research title, Analysis of Indigenous Root Crops, Yam, uh, Containing Inulin in uh, a Sugar Substitute. So let us all welcome uh, Professor Marjale Periol. Good day, everyone. Good day, everyone. This is Marjane Ferrigal from Roman State University 
a faculty of the College of Agriculture, Fishery, and Coffee. Today, I'm going to present to you my study entitled Analysis of Indigenous Root Crops, Young Juice Korea Species, Containing Inulin, a Sugar Substitute. The indigenous root crops propagate naturally and a highly productive crop, even in marginal areas adapted to diverse conditions, varied types of soil, and farming practices. Yam is one of the underutilized indigenous root crops, which is a source of stable carbohydrate for many people among rural communities and a potential source of value-added products. Used in manufacturing starts, alcohol, fermented foods, beverages, etc. It provides an efficient source of carbohydrates compared to other food crops. It is also an alternative to rice, served as merienda. Cook with meat and other vegetables, and also serve as desserts such as cakes, ice cream, plants, spread cookies, and candies. Nutritionally, tubers have potential in providing economical sources of dietary energy by pro providing one-third of an equivalent weight from rice and wheat. Good source of carbohydrates, energy, vitamins, proteins, minerals, and also rich and phosphorus have numerous bioactive components such as mucin, juicin, juicorin, allantoin, choline, polyphenols, juicenin, and vitamins such as carotenoids and copperols. Yam production in Tabas Island, province of Umblon, is very abundant, especially during harvest time and comes the holiday season. It was observed that there was a decreasing amount in terms of production, though the su supply of over the market at harvest, but the demand is very low. Thus resulted in oversupply and spoilage of the crops that sometimes makes the farmers decide not to produce cropping season. Since yam is very promising and very potential, one way to encourage farmers to maintain and sustain production is by enhancing the potential and usage of these crops through comprehensive study to be of great value in helping to achieve food security as a component of food sufficiency program as a whole. Tubers can be used as a source of nutritionally functional foods like inulin that provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of disease. Inulin type fruit plant is non digestible carbohydrates with numerous nutritional properties beneficial to human health. Nutritional and health benefits of inulin function as dietary fiber, caloric value, fiber enrichment, as a prebiotic, as a fat replacer and a sugar replacer. It may improve digestive health, relieve constipation, promote weight loss, and help control diabetes. The inulin is extensively used among the food sectors, grounded on its functional attributes, which could respond to the consumer's demand, particularly the elderly and health-conscious individual to develop healthy food stops fit for them to stay healthy. In this time of pandemic, to fight COVID-19, many people are trying to become fit and healthy, consume food that are economically good and nutritious. Avoidance of sweet, fatty, and tasty foods are on the wish list. To attain this diet is a reminder. Using food high in immune content is vital in enhancing the quality of diets, improving food and nutrition security, which is beneficial for the improvement and maintenance of human health and its wellness. Hence, the study was conducted to further explore and utilize the ample local materials of indigenous root crops, yam, a potential source of inulin. For the significance of the study, the result of the study will serve as benchmark information for breeding purposes for further improvement of yam species containing high inulin. It could open up new opportunities for the local farmers to cultivate and be more productive in producing yam tubers. This will increase market demand and will increase production and utilization, thus will lead to poverty reduction. 
it will provide information to the consumers, especially to health conscious individuals, on the benefits they can get in consuming this kind of food. The food manufacturing in enhancing and developing such kind of novel food essential for health improvement. This study was conducted on August 19th of May 2020. It was limited on the analysis of inland content of yam found in Tablas Island. This is the map of Umblon showing the nine municipalities of Tablas wherein the accession were collected. Also the just Korea species known locally with its vernacular names. For the methodology, the collection of the accession were collected from nine municipalities of the Tablas Island. A laboratory experiment was conducted at the Research Laboratory Center of Cavite State University main campus in Dang Cavite. Yam was washed in running water with manual brushing to remove all the specks of dirt dried, peeled, and weighed. About 20 grams was taken, then cut into small pieces and placed in a food blender. Distilled water was added at one is to one weight to volume ratio of two birds to water and blended to achieve homogeneous consistency. This solution was contained in a beaker and sonicated for six minutes. The resulting suspension was kept at 90 degrees Celsius, water bath for one hour, and filtered with while hot through a cheese cloth. The resulting solution was stored in a container at four degrees Celsius until used. For the HPLC analysis, the extract was filtered through, a, through the use of syringe and ingested an HPLC with a refractor index, index detector. The number of sugar was determined against a standard calibrated plot. For the results, based on the result of HPL's analysis, different levels of inulin content were produced from the extracted young tubers. This means that the Juice Korea species and Tabas Island have the potential source of inulin that could be studied further. The normality of the inulin content of Yam was determined using the Shapiro Walk test statistics, using a 0 0.05 level of significance, a result of 0.393 with a P value of 0 0.00 with significance at, five, at 0 0.05 level. Hence, the inulin content of YAM was not normally distributed and parametric test procedure not applicable. Based on the result, the local name Ubi has the highest amount of inulin, followed by Buru and Senawa, and the rest also manifested fairly similar results among the samples who gained the lowest mean. For the conclusion, the study has revealed the different levels of inulin was proved that different species collected in Tablas Island. This shows that the island still have diverse species, which are a good source of carbohydrates, capable and potential of producing tubers for the production of more inulin. Further, the anal analyzed high inulin content species are possible for mass cultivation and be processed as functional food and sugar substitutes that are of great value and will be a component of the food sufficiency program of the province. Thank you and good, afternoon, good day. So, okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mariel. Uh, Marjorie, for you for your uh, for sharing with us your paper, uh, research paper. Our next presenter is from Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, Sipokat Campus from Sipokat Commodore Philippines, with uh, her uh, research title on species listing morphometric characterization and geotagging of natural occurrence, natural occurring mushroom in Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, Basaka Campus. Let's now welcome Ms. Eunice G. Zuela. Thank you. 
Hey to everyone. Our scholarly study is entitled Species Listing, Morphometric Characterization and Geotagging of Naturally Occurring Mushrooms in Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, Pasacarao Campus. It is reasonable to wonder why we have chosen this specific topic to discuss, and the explanation is as follows. The Board of Regents of School Bicol State University of Agriculture provided an avenue to the development of the CPSUA Processing and Research Center under Resolution Number 35, Series of 2020, which would serve as a hub for mushroom related practical scientific researches, innovations, and production. The Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, Pasacao Campus, was an ideal site in conducting the study due to vast hectare land reservations, massive vegetation, as well as abundance of woody plants and trees that eventually contributed to the pile of decomposing organic matter that makes an ideal substrate in growing mushrooms. As macrofungi are still understudied over most of the world, according to Muller et al. 2006, this study is accounted for gathering and identification of all the indigenous macrofungi species, providing a list of mushrooms, to assess the macrofungal diversity of CBSUA Pasikao campus and contribute to the mushroom center's pure plasm collection. The objectives of the study is up to first, identify the species of macrofungi that are present in the CBSUA Pasikao campus. Second, determine the morphometric characterization of the collected naturally occurring macrofungi of CBSUA Pasikao campus with special emphasis to Type, values, gills, and attachment to the substrate. Third, enumerate the substrate utilized by the collected samples. And lastly, distinguish the logical location of the collected macrofungi of CBS to Apasical Campus. Methodology Collection of naturally occurring mushrooms. Collected macrofungi are photographed on its substrate as samples were handled carefully to avoid contamination. All gathered specimens were placed in polypropylene bag, properly labeled, sealed, and carried for morphological identification to the CBSUAC Pocket Campus Agriculture and Industrial Technology Research Center. Tools used in collecting macrofungi. Knife, hand shovel, specimen container, bags or labels, phones, camera, and compass. Identification of collected mushrooms. These were guided based on the macroscopic features in the book A Field Guide to Mushrooms by Kent H. McKnight and Vera B. McKnight, which is published in the year 1987. Also, with the use of Mushroom Identify app and Google Lens. Preparation of media. One liter of matured coconut water is added with 20 grams of shredded white lemon bar and mix until the solution is homogenized. Then, solutions are put into Erlen Mayer's flask, plugged with cotton as well as secured with aluminum foil or paper and rubber band. Afterwards, the prepared media was placed in an autoclave for sterilization process at 15 PSI per 121 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. Fully sterilized media were dispensed in petri dishes and allowed to cool and solidify. Preparation of cup for stipeless mushroom. The cup of the collected macrofungi was placed inside the sterilized bottle that contains the 10% sodium hypochlorite solution using forceps and shaken for 2 to 3 minutes for sanitizing purposes. This was followed by transferring the mushroom cups using forceps to the 90% solution of sterilized tap water in another bottle, which was repeated for three times. Note that separate bottles must be used to avoid spoilage of the collected specimen. Afterwards, the sanitized mushroom cup is held using tweezers or forceps directly placed into petri plate and cut into tiny pieces using scissors. Meanwhile, for mushrooms with side, tools must expose to alcohol lamp before using for sterilization purposes. Then, mushroom was placed on clean paper for two to three hours to get the moisture presently evaporated. This was followed by, mushroom will be slit open into halves longitudinally. Then finally, in the petri dish, use a blade or scalpel, 
Cut a small piece of tissue from the mushroom. Inoculation and incubation includes preparation of the newly solidified media inside the laminal probe. Tissue inoculated at the center using three cells of 5 mm cork powder, which will be sealed with clean wrap. As newly inoculated media will be placed in an incubation chamber under room temperature or 25 degrees Celsius based on IUPAC and was allowed to ramify. Results and discussion. Topography of CBS UA Quasitalus. It is located at the Santa Rosa del Norte, Pasacal Camarines Sur, along the now Pasacal Road, which is situated at approximately 0.5284 north and 123.0416 is in the Pasacal Zone. Elevation at these coordinates is estimated at 127.6 meters or 418.6 mean sea level according to Philippine Atlas 2021. Furthermore, Pasacal had tropical rainforest climate, yet during the month of July, it is categorized as the fourth warmest month of the year in which daytime maximum averages around according to weather to visit 2021. Morphometric characterization of collected naturally occurring mushrooms. Morphometrics refers to the study of shape variation of organisms and its cooperation with other variables according to Casanova 2017. Data elucidated eight macrofungal collected in which three are with scythe and five have none. Mushroom with scythe includes Yoko agaricus americanus or reddening reputa, Borvalella bolbacea or the paddy straw mushroom, and Paralipista flacida or the Talmic final cup. Mushroom without type includes Skysophyllum commune or the common split gill, Trematis versicolor or also known as turkey tail, Trematis gibosa or lumpy bracket, Pycnoporus coccineus or the orange bracket, as well as Trematis cubensis or the poroid bracket fungus. Mushroom shape campus. Four macrofungi species were classified as bracket shape, like of Traumatis cubensis. One tightly packed coral, one conical, one funnel shaped, and one depressed mushroom. Mushrooms margin of pileus. Data is data for macrofungi, which has entire or smooth pileus, three irregular or wavy, and one split or crenate. Mushrooms gill spacing. Among the collected macrofungi, there are three which has gills and five have none, in which two belongs to the group of species which has closed gill, while one has crowded. Mushrooms gill attachment to the site. One species is adnate, one is adnext, and one is descending. Environmental substrates of naturally occurring mushrooms. Five species were found growing on decaying logs and woods, two on soil, and one on rotten banana trunk. That mapping of the geological location of mushrooms in CBSUA Pasacal campus. The presented map shows the exact places in the site where the naturally occurring macrofungi were collected in which different colors represent different species. Overall, there are five wood rotting, two soil fungi, and one straw mushroom that was listed and found. Summary and conclusion. Findings reveal that with minimal number of mushrooms found at site consisting of five families, six genera, and eight species, CBSUA Pasacal Campus is still considered as a natural habitat of macrofungal species with promising potential for various applications. Recommendations. It is highly recommended to conduct a monthly collection of mushrooms on site in order to identify and gather more of its species in a year-round basis. Furthermore, it is also desirable to utilize and run molecular identification procedures to precisely determine the species of the collected sample. The following are the references. Thank you for listening and God bless everyone. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Zuela, for sharing with us your paper, uh, your research paper.
Um, our next presenter is from University of Islamalang, Indonesia, with her uh, research title on marketing mix and uh, consumer decisions and purchasing purchasing organic uh, vegetables at modern market in Malang East Java, Indonesia. So let us now welcome our fifth presenter, um, Professor Nick Matul Kuria. Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second international conference on education, environment, and agriculture, Philippines. Uh, I'm Nikmatul Khairia from Department of Agribusiness, Faculty of Agriculture, University of Islam Malang, Indonesia. Will present my article entitled Marketing Mix and Consumer Decision in Purchasing Organic Vegetables and Modern Markets in Malang, East Java, Indonesia. This article written by Muhammad Isbadul Khairat, Bambang Siswadi, and I'm Nikmatul Khairia. My outline presentation, introduction, method, some PLS and data, result and discussion, conclusion and suggestion. Trend of organic vegetables consumption in Indonesia increasing in pandemic COVID-19 almost 20% based on data Central Bureau of Statistics 2020. Consumption of sufficient nutrition and balanced food contributes significant for the first and second sustainable development goals, SDGs, namely no hungry and no poverty. Consumer purchasing decision making stage includes problem recognition, information searching, purchase decision, and post purchase behavior based on Amrulo 2020 and the concept of a well-organized and meticulously managed marketing mix is critical to achieving success in areas such as boosting sales volume, creating profits and cultivating a sense of containment and desire in repurchasing and product. So, the objective of this study to look at the effect of marketing mix and customer decision on our budget. May touch of the research uh, selection appropriate model using structural equation model with a partial square the preparation using primary data for modern market, collecting at for modern market, Lailai Fresh, Super Indo Telogomas, Hyper Malang Town Square, and Giant Supermarket Dinoyo, all of which are modern markets in Malang City. This study uh, using 80 respondents. And uh, by accidental sampling, because population is not probability knows. And the study was uh, placed between January to March of 2021. And the data analysis includes seven variables. Marketing mix consists of product, promotion, people, price, place, process, and physical evidence. 
there is a discussion for this study. Uh, the first, we look the marketing mix effect on organic vegetable purchases in figure in inner model, and then we have a, a equation and for the model also have analyzed for f of author model consists convergent validity discriminant validity composite reliability and crotchbach alpha and evolution of the inner models also done uh, the path coefficient test goodness of fit test and the key square for this model uh, we analyze that the goodness of fit model we have 1.73 it indicated the model is a strong and uh, goodness of fit the structural model of purchasing organic vegetable at modern market in Malang, uh, beside, uh, depend on product, positive product, and then negative price, positive place, positive promotion, positive people, positive physical evidence, and positive process. For the next slide, we see the marketing mix effect on organic vegetable purchases and for the seven variable only four there are four variable highly significant for organic vegetable purchases and there are three variable is not significant Conclusion for this research, uh, one, uh, there are four marketing mix, products, promotion, people, and process had a high significant impact on organic vegetable purchasing decision in Malang City. Product, promotion, people, and process all have positive coefficients indicating that these four variables influence the decision to buy organic vegetables. And the three variables of price, location, and physical evidence has no effect because the price different, because the price different is insignificant, it can be assumed that consumer continue to purchase organic vegetable despite rising prices. This demonstrates that organic vegetable consumers value eating organic vegetables. And the finding of this study demonstrate that consumer in Malang, Indonesia, use organic vegetables as way as a way of life in order to raise knowledge about disease prevention. Okay, thank you for hearing me and see you in Indonesia. Thank you. Okay, we just heard our uh, from our five presenters uh, various topics and researches in agriculture our presenters are now ready to answer some queries which may have related to their research so any questions from the audience Um, we have a question here for our first presenter. Is Miss uh, Amistosa is around? Okay. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good morning. Good morning po. Good morning, uh, Ms. Amistosa. Okay. Um, the question here is, uh, what do you think is your contribution uh, based on your study? Is uh, your contribution on the body of knowledge based from your study? Um, from my study, ma'am, um, um, several approaches were conducted, like DNA barcoding, geometric morphometrics. So, um, from these methods, um, you can, um, especially in the identification of plants, which are difficult, uh, researchers are difficult to um, identify. Um, these are complementary methods that we can use to identify um, these plant samples. Yes, ma'am. This can be these methods can be useful in the identification of plants as complement new approaches. So okay, thank you very much, Miss and Miss Basso. Um, we have also a question here for the second presenter, Dr. Celso Santo Domingo. Dr. Morning, Santa Domingo. Okay. Morning. Yes. So, um, <laughs> huh? okay. um, Dr. Santa Domingo, uh, the question here is, in what certain level of parasitic infection that can cause death or, to the rabbits? Or is uh, parasitic uh, parasites can cause death to the rabbits on and on what level um it's depend on the type of the of cgspc and okay. what are objectives of this study is to only identify so we did not perform the actual count of the infection level but um in hepatic toxicosis it's our um, at the level of around 40 percent can cause a severe hepatic oxygenosis. Okay. And in Tainia species, it's a, only a intermediate host, so it cannot alleviate or the health of a rabbit. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Santo Domingo. Thank you. Okay. Um, our uh, we have also some question to a third presenter. Is uh, Professor Marcel Creole is around here in the session? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Um, uh, some questions uh, regarding on your side. Um, is uh, is insulin? Is being different though from uh, in inulin though is inulin being different from insulin? I yeah. Uh, although they are the same, uh, producing sugar, but yes. uh, inulin is taken from the uh, root crops though, or some other vegetables that can be used as a substitute or source of sugar. Okay, so they are almost the same. Okay. Definitely. Uh, definitely, yes. So, okay, thank you very much, me and Professor Prayal. Thank you. And also, we have also a question here from, uh, for our next presenter from CBHPA Sakao Campus, Ms. Uh, Zuela. Is Ms. Zuela, uh, is our, uh, wait, good morning, Ms. Zuela. Um, we have a question here for you. Um, from those identified and listed variety of mushroom, which of 
those are edible or these are which of those are edible and which of those are not edible so 